Well, we're in the book of Ecclesiastes. We are in the third session. Remember, of course, it's written in Hebrew, but the opening verses give you the tone of the whole book, so I like to review from that. It says, the words of the preacher, which is a a variation of the word that's the Hebrew word for the book. The preacher, the son of David, the king in Jerusalem. And it's widely regarded by most competent scholars that it was indeed Solomon. It was fashionable for some years to sort of question that by some, but most of those critics have been discredited. That we, uh, we take the view that it really was Solomon for lots of reasons. He, he says so frequently all through the books, it's vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And that would seem to be the primary theme of the book, but, uh, but you need to recognize that this is man's wisdom given by one of the wisest men that's walked the earth, one of the richest men that walked the earth. But he's dealing with it from the terms of man's view of everything under the sun. In other words, it's man's best guess, which is falls short of God's revelation. In fact, as you look at what he really he's really saying, though, it's not as pessimistic as some people tend to regard it. We'll watch that closely. But in any case, he says, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? In other words, all that you do for yourselves on the earth in this life is empty, is a vapor, it vanishes. But he's going to go beyond that as we watch his pondering of these topics, both in the front of the book in chapter 1, also in chapter 12 where it closes. Koaleth, the preacher, or the assembler, if you will. And uh, Solomon's sermon is on natural man's quest for the chief good. And it's a cumulative treatise of many parts, and we're going to go through those parts piece by piece and get a better grasp of what he's really saying. His conclusion is all is vanity, but that has some conditions. It is not pessimistic. We're going to discover that it's actually just bravely honest rather than pessimistic, and it sees beyond life's ironies to uh, the control of God of our lives and our future. And so, book of Ecclesiastes. First couple of verses was a broad quest by personal experiments, search for wisdom and pleasure. We're now in that section in which he's going to re-examine some of those uh, conclusions, um, ills and enigmas of human society. And then he's going to talk subsequent chapters about practical morality, emphasizing that material things cannot satisfy the soul. And Solomon ought to know, because he had no restrictions. He had virtually unlimited wealth, and he was king. Uh, Yet he came to the conclusion nothing that that he could get his hands on would satisfy. And he'll review, but his reviews and conclusions may surprise you. Um, It's amazing to me how many commentators on the book miss the real point of the book. So, And the final significance is uh, from Ecclesiastes 12. Let's, Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is Solomon talking. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. That is not a statement of a pessimist. That is a statement of someone who's bravely honest, who has incredible resources, who has delved into these issues uh, with some depth. Let us remind ourselves going in what Jesus said about life. He says, I am come that ye might have life and that uh, we might have it more abundantly. And Paul echoes a similar thought it says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So let's keep that in mind as we consider some of these things. You know, I'm looking at probably a dozen commentaries on this book as I try to get background. I have to tell you candidly that Warren Wearsby's commentary is head and shoulders above the rest, in my opinion, because he really seems, and I think, has a very fresh grasp of what the book's really all about. But he points out uh, quotations from two famous professors. The first one is from George Santayana, who taught at Harvard from 1889 to 1912. He wrote, he says, Why shouldn't things be largely absurd, futile, and transitory? They are so, and we are so, and they and we go very well together. That's Santayana's view from Harvard. And uh, Joseph Crutch, who's professor of English at Columbia from 37 to 52, He said, quote, There is no reason to suppose that a man's life has any more meaning than the life of the humblest insect that crawls from one annihilation to another, close quote. Now, both of these men were brilliant in their fields, but I think most of us would not agree with their perspectives. We believe that something much grander is involved in the human uh, life than than simply transitory existence. We are not like insects. 
And I think that uh, certainly uh, Crutch knew that insects have life cycles, but men and women have life histories. One bee is pretty much like any other bee, but uh, uh, people are unique, and there are no two stories the same. You can write a book on the life of the bee, but uh, uh, you can't write a book that would just say the life of man or woman. It wouldn't be distinctive. So, so as individuals, we're unique. And uh, if we were not unique, we're not important. And if we're not important, then life has no meaning. If life had no meaning, then life isn't worth living, according to Solomon's reckoning, too. So we might as well, if that were all true, we might as well follow the Epicurean philosophy, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. But Solomon is going to present four arguments proving that life was nothing but grasping at soap bubbles and chasing after the wind, it would seem. But he was too wise a man to let his own arguments go unchallenged. And so in chapter 3, which we're taking on tonight, through chapter 10, we'll just take chapter 3 and 4 tonight, but from 3 to 10, he's re-examining each of his own arguments. His first argument that we explored in that first session, chapter 1, dealt with the monotony of life. And as he examined it in chapter 3 and 4, um, he'll discover that there are four factors which must be considered before you can say that life is monotonous, meaningless. In fact, he's going to discover quite the contrary. Life is very highly varied and enigmatic. That's really a different conclusion altogether. See, he's going to see four things. First, he's going to see something above man, a God who is in control of time and who balanced life's experiences. That's Solomon's observation. Then he saw something within man that linked him to God, eternity in his heart. He's going to discover that. And uh, then thirdly, he's going to see something ahead of man, the certainty of death. And he talks again about that. In fact, he talks about that quite a bit in, throughout the book. He finally he saw things uh, around man, namely problems and burdens of life. And so he, he's going to ask his listeners, that you and I, to look up, look within, look ahead, and look around. And take into consi- consideration time, eternity, death, and suffering. And these are four factors that God uses to keep our lives from being monotonous or meaningless. Well, let's just jump in then. Let's take a look at uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We're going to, the first section is going to talk about looking up, how God orders time. And uh, you don't have to be a philosopher or a scientist to uh, experience that uh, we have times and seasons that are a regular part of life. In fact, were it not for the dependability of God's cycles and laws, that um, life would be chaotic, if not impossible. Now, not only are there times and seasons in the world, but there's also an overruling providence in our lives. And that's one thing that we're going to see here. From before our birth until the moment of our death, God is accomplishing His divine purposes. And even though we may not understand what they are uh, or what He's doing. I have to tell you candidly, uh, Nan and I have really come to um, enjoy the seasons. Now, that's surprising because we're both uh, three or four generation deep uh, Southern Californians. And in Southern California, there's they have four seasons too. Fires, mudslides, uh, smog, and so on. And I'm being facetious, of course. But um, no, seriously, living there, you don't have the feeling of the seasons you do in, in, in other parts of the country. And it's uh, it's interesting. We have we had uh, we have lived in Denver in our early married years. We also lived in in the east in Michigan. We have really grown to love the poetry of the seasons, which is in, in a sense is a new experience for us. There's just something healthy, uh, emotionally as well as physically, about the cycle. Feel it, being able to feel the year go by. We really we really uh, enjoy that. And. Uh, for what it's worth, you know. Well, now, Solomon's going to give us 14 statements that affirms that God is working in our lives and seeking to accomplish His will. And, and uh, all these events that we experience come from God, and they come in their time. And uh, if we cooperate with God's timing, life will not be meaningless. And uh, in, ver- in fact, verse 11 says, everything in its time is beautiful. So let's just jump in. Verse 1. In fact, this may ring familiar. There's a very, I, I was hoping to get, get, prepare a recording so you could hear it. You all may remember it. These, this first part of this book is a popular song. You didn't realize that Solomon wrote one of your songs, did you? <laughs> to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. 
a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Now, there's a list here of 14 opposites, really, each of which happens in its time. It's interesting that Solomon used a multiple of seven, 14, which is, and it begins his list with birth and death, of course, which is highly significant. In fact, the, the number 70, in fact, even suggests completeness. Uh, and, and the use of the polar opposites and so forth. This is a well-known poetical technique called um, merism, and it's intended to suggest totality as a package. So uh, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. You know, it seems strange to us because in our minds the things like abortion, birth control, mercy killing, surrogate parenthood, All these things make it look as though man is really in control of birth and death. But Solomon said otherwise, in a more absolute sense. And I suggest for your notes, you might look at Psalm 139. In the interest of time, I didn't uh, put that on the screen. But it basically states that God so wove us in the womb that our genetic structure is perfect for the work that he's prepared for us to do. When did God first start thinking about you? Before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4. And Psalm 139 deals with that. Now, we may intervene and hasten our death, but we can't prevent it. And when our time comes, God so wills it. And there's examples of that in the Scripture. And uh, Psalm 139, verse 16 says, All the days ordained for me were written in your book. That's the NIV version. It also speaks in this first uh, verse about a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Bear in mind that the Israelites were an agricultural people. Their religious calendar was built on the agricultural year. And there's a time when you plow and plant. And there's a time also when you pluck up, which could be reaping or it also could be pulling out the unproductive plants, if you will. And a successful farmer realized that unless you understand how nature works for him, he has to work with nature is the point. He understood you need to understand God's principles and cooperate with them. And verse 3 speaks a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up. Now the killing here probably refers not to war, but to self-defense or uh, results of sickness or plague in the land. First Samuel 2 deals with some of that. God permits some to die and some to be healed. And this does not imply that we should refuse medical aid. There are some religious extremists that sometimes create tragedy by not taking advantage of the resources God has put at our disposal. God can use natural means. He can use uh, uh, technological breakthroughs that have been developed, and He can also use miracles on occasions, and He does. And we see some very conspicuous examples of that all through the Scripture, where the the sun standing still in Joshua 10, uh, or other examples in in Isaiah 38 and so on. Verse 4, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Boy, that's certainly true. It's part of our walk. There's time that we weep with those that weep, and mourn with those that mourn. And uh, also there's a time to dance. You may recall the movie Footloose, which tried to celebrate that very thing with a preacher's kid and, and so forth, the desire to express themselves in a dance against a very restrictive environment. Verse 5, and a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. Israel is a rocky land, and a lot of your farming had to do with clearing your fields before you can plow and plant. Also, if you wanted to hurt an enemy, you'd fill his field with rocks. <laughs> People also gathered stones for building walls and, and houses. Stones are neither good nor bad. That depends on how you use them. And uh, there are places where it's very useful to gather stones. Whenever we're in Israel, we walk down from the Mount of Olives down to the Mark Gethsemane. I always encourage people to take a couple of rocks, put them in your pocket, and then use it to make a little trophy for your house that people ask about, what on earth is that? And you see, that was one of the rocks, that was one of the stones that didn't cry out. And quoting from Luke 19 and the whole 
70-week prophecy that's fulfilled on that day and so forth. It's a, you can make these things a memorabilia if you like. But anyway, uh, also in this verse it talks about embracing and refraining from embracing. You know, it's interesting how people from different ethnic backgrounds have different ways of expressing themselves. And, and uh, certainly in the Middle East, as among other places, there's a, there's a tendency to be very demonstrative. There's a lot of hugging and kissing goes on, even among men, whatever. And uh, uh, that's also true in Russia and elsewhere. It's sometimes uh, it seems very strange that they, uh, but they have this deep emotional, uh, the touchy feely kind of, of uh, embracing and so forth. This could be uh, equivalent, really, to saying hello and saying goodbye. Also, in effect, the same same expressions there. And, and then in verse six, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. A better translation would be a time to search and a time to give it up for lost is a, perhaps a more precise translation. This is the biblical authority for a garage sale. There's a time to buy, there's a time to get rid of stuff, okay? Time to keep and a time to keep out. I sometimes call it the Kenny Roger theology. You know, Kenny Rogers, remember you're the gambler? A time to hold him and a time to fold him. A time to walk, a walk away and a time to run. <laughs> Verse 7, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. And this probably, in, in part, suggests the strange Jewish practice of tearing their clothes uh, for during a time of grief or repentance. You know, God does expect us to um, sorrow during bereavement, but not like the unbelievers. One of the things that we need to do, perhaps more effectively, is celebrate when a believer has joined our Lord. But again, there's times to take out the needle and thread and start sewing things up. Verse 8, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Are God's people allowed to hate? The fact that it mentions war and peace here suggests that Solomon really had the nation primarily in mind. But there are some things that even Christians ought to hate. And for your notes, you can, I'll give you a few verses you can jot down and check this out. Second Chronicles 19.2, Psalm 97.10. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, and Revelation 2, verses 6 and 15. Second Chronicles 19, 2, Psalm 97, 10, Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, and Revelation 2, verses 6 and 15. Life is sort of like a doctor's prescription. Taking certain things alone, they can kill you, but properly blended, they can bring healing. So there are things that you should have righteous indignation over and so on. But in any case, God is sovereignly in control, and He's in control of everything. And there's a purpose for everything. And this is not fatalism. It doesn't rob us, if you will, of freedom or responsibility. It's simply the wise provision of a loving Father. And He promises to do all these things for our own good in Romans 8.28. You might, um, I often joke about this, but you might make sure you have a tab on Romans 8.28. Hardly a day, day goes by where you don't check to make sure it's still there. And the most important words that, of that verse are the first three. And we know that all things work together for good. For everybody know, for them that love God, to them are, who are the called according to His purpose. Precious, precious verse. Well, now we're going to shift and look from, from this 14 opposites to um, ourselves inside. You might label this uh, eternity as in your heart. Solomon continues here. He's no longer, frankly, looking at life under the sun, which is sort of the theme of the whole letter. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Now, in verse 9, he's really repeating the question of the, that opened the, the book, third verse of the first chapter. Is all this labor really worth it? Now, in light of so-called new evidence, or Solomon's present, he's presently re-examining these statements, he's going to give three answers to that question. Uh, his first answer is that man's life itself is a gift of God. See, in view of the travail that we experience from day to day, Life may seem like a strange gift, but it's God's gift just the same. And we may be exercising ourselves trying to uh, answer uh, or explain life's enigmas, and we don't always succeed. But if we believingly accept life as a gift and thank God for it, 
we will exhibit a better attitude towards the burdens that may be put upon us as, along the way. If we grudgingly accept life as a burden, then we'll miss the gifts that come along with it. And our outlook determines our outcome. I've seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. P- profound insight in the way he expresses that. The travails in your life, some minor, some serious, but they're God-given. And he has a purpose in each one of those. Why? To exercise us in it, to grow our faith, to strengthen us. And in that growth, prepare us to comfort Christians that will then have similar burdens put upon them. Maybe a clue to some of the ministries that are ahead of us. And uh, in verse 11, He hath made everything beautiful in His time. Also He has set the world in their heart. Now this, the world here in the Hebrew, it's translated world in the King James, but the Hebrew word is olam. It's a word that embraces the concept of eternity, long duration, antiquity, futurity, forever, everlasting, both forward and back. It's King James says, set the world in their heart. He really has set eternity in your heart. And uh, man was created in the image of God, and he was given dominion over the creation. Therefore, man is different than the rest of creation. These parallels that some people draw between man and animals or insects and stuff are naive or incomplete because they don't understand that man is distinctive, and expressly so. And one of the distinctives is that he has eternity in his heart. And yet uh, no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. See, this explains why nobody, including Solomon, can be satisfied with his or her endeavors and achievements uh, or is able to explain the enigmas of life God accomplishes for his own purposes in his time. And it will not be till we enter eternity that we will begin to comprehend God's total plan. Some people often draw the analogy, it's like looking at tapestry from the back side. Have you ever looked at a t- complex tapestry from the back side? It's a hodgepodge of threads, and it isn't until you see the front you really understand the intent of the, of the artist. He continues, I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. I know there's no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. See, this is his third conclusion. Man's life can be enjoyable now. And uh, he's going to emphasize this in all these verses that are 12, 13, and 14. He hinted at this back in chapter 2. I called your attention to it at that time. He was careful to say that even the enjoyment of life is a gift of God. Life is a gift, but so our ability to enjoy it is also a gift of God. And this is a very important theme throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. It's going to be emphasized in each of the four major sections in chapters 3 to chapter 10. Now what Solomon is encouraging here is not pagan hedonism, but rather the practice of enjoying God's gift as the fruit of one's labor, no matter how difficult life may be. Life may appear to us as being transitory or temporary, but whatever God does is forever so that when we live in Him and let him have his way, life will be meaningful and life will be manageable. So this is really what he's... So instead of complaining what we don't have, we should simply enjoy what we do have and thank God for it. And that's why I think Warren Wearsby labels his commentary on Ecclesiastes, the table is be satisfied. Wherever you are, whatever it is, be satisfied. That's a key thread through this entire essay. I know that there's no good in them but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. And for the ability to enjoy it. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Boy, that says it all, doesn't it? Now notice the psalm's not saying, you know, be ha- don't worry, be happy. He's promoting faith in God, not faith in faith or pie in the sky. It's amazing how many people and how often we'll see uh, movies or literature things which seem to extol having faith, never pinning their, never identifying having faith in what? Having faith in emptiness is stupidity. The issue is not having faith. The issue is having faith in the right things and uh, having faith in God. It's amazing how many people seem to make faith itself as if it's an end. No, it's a, 
It's uh, intended to be a transitive verb with an object, in effect. Now, how can life be meaningless and monotonous for you when God has made you part of His eternal plan? There's a basic contradiction there. See, you're not some insignificant insect crawling around uh, from one sad annihilation to another. If you've trusted Jesus Christ, you are a child of God being prepared for an eternal home. And John 14, first half dozen verses emphasize that. Jesus lays it out for you. 2 Corinthians 4, so on. The Puritan pastor Thomas Watson said, Eternity to the godly is a day that has no sunset. Eternity to the wicked is a night that has no sunrise. We can't imagine being without hope. Solomon includes these three verses by saying, I know that whatsoever God doeth it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken away from it. It's God that doeth it, and the men should fear before Him. This is the proper attitude for us, the fear of the Lord. This isn't the cringing slave before a cruel master. It's the submission of an obedient child to a loving parent. And if we fear God, we need not fear anything else because he's in control. And I think that uh, it's amazing, I think, to see that so operative, among other places in our service academies. It's interesting how in the military service, some people, you can argue the military service is the most noble of all professions. You say, what? Yes, Jesus said, there's no greater love than this than he that's willing to lay down his life for his friends. And there are callings, whether it's firemen, whether it's the military service, many callings, in which part of the package is the reality that they, almost on a daily basis, lay down their life for what they're committed to. And I don't know how you take on a profession like that if you're not a godly person, if you don't have a commitment to Jesus Christ. It would be terrifying otherwise. Well, let's move on to the next section. That we're, He said, look within. Now he's going to say, look ahead. And what he's looking ahead is something that's certain for all of us. We all have an appointment with death. Solomon's already mentioned the certainty of death in chapter 2, and he's going to bring this up again in chapter 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, and 12. Life, death, time, eternity are all fundamental ingredients that make up our brief existence in this world, and they can't be ignored. We may not like the topics, but they cannot be ignored. Verse 15, that which hath seen is now, and that which is to be hath already been. And God requireth that which is past. Now here's another uh, important insight by Solomon. He recognizes there's a thing called accountability. The past isn't gone forever. There's going to be an accountability for it. This is part in chapter 1. He called, In effect, he called it the cycle of life. And the past seems to repeat itself, it would seem. He says there's nothing new in the sun. But see, God can break into history and do what he pleases. And he has many miracles that evidence the cycle is a pattern and not a prison. There are cycles in history. There are cycles all over, but these cycles God can intervene and does. In fact, God is unique. In fact, even our understanding of God is unique in that our God is transcendent from His creation, separate from His creation. You may not re- realize this, but it's, the Bible is the only holy book that presents a God of that kind. That he's distinct and transcendent from His creation. On the one hand, and yet He also has the interest and capability to enter his creation and participate with us. And he did. That's what the person of Jesus Christ is all about. He actually entered his creation to fulfill the requirements of his creation. And he broke, Jesus Christ broke this vicious cycle, if you will, this life-death cycle, because he, he can now make us part of a new creation because he's overcome time and death. But Solomon adds a new account here. He says that uh, God will call the past into account. It's the way the NIV handles verse 15. It's a difficult thing to translate. What he literally says is God seeks what hurries along. He really seems to say that time goes by swiftly and gets away from us, but God to keep track of it and will, at the end of time, call into account everything that we've done with the time we have. That's a terrifying thing, to be accountable for everything we've, we've done. Now, this will tie in with verses 16 and 17, where Psalm is going to dwell on the injustices of his day. 
I wonder why divine judgment's been delayed. That's a common theme uh, in literature in general and the Bible in particular. But let's go verse 16. Moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and every work. This raises the classical question, of course, how can God be in control when there's so much evil in our world? with the wicked prospering in their sin and the righteous suffering for their obedience? Those are tough questions. I don't think there's anything that more universally raises our ire than injustice. We have a great deal of difficulty trying to define justice. If you've ever been in a law course or something and you had to try to define what do we mean by justice, it's a difficult task on the one hand. But there's nothing more universal or expressive or focused, than injustice. You almost end up defining justice as the absence of injustice. But anyway, Solomon will comfort himself on this whole topic with two assurances. That God has a time for everything, including judgment. We're going to see that in chapter 8. And God is working out His eternal purposes in and through the deeds of men, even the deeds of the wicked. It's hard for us to understand. But strangely enough, even Satan and even the wickedness in this world is ultimately uh, going to be used of God, in effect. Strange, but uh, clear. Okay, verse 18. I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them as one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. He's not really saying there's no difference uh, uh, over man and beast, but he's saying there, there are some things in common, and there's a difference. He merely pointed out that man and beast have two things in common. They both die, and their bodies return to dust. But man is made in the image of God, and man has a definite advantage over animals as far as life is concerned. But when it comes to the fact of death... Man has no special advantage. He too turns to dust, is, the, is what Solomon is saying. And we know, of course, especially from the New Testament insight, that those who are saved in Christ will one day be resurrected and have glorified bodies suitable for their heavenly home. 1 Corinthians 15 is uh, not only deals with that, but is arguably the most important chapter in the Bible. Because Paul himself says if we don't have chapter 15 and what it contains, we have nothing. So if you have concerns about this or you're starting to misunderstand Solomon here, encourage you to just plunge headlong in 1 Corinthians 15. But what he's saying here is that all go to one place, all are of dust, and all are turned to dust again. He's speaking in strictly naturalistic terms. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, I do have to apologize to pet lovers. My daughter Lisa pointed out, she's quite a horse fancier, that there must be horses in heaven because Jesus comes back riding to one. And she was wondering about animals in general. I pointed out there has to be cats in heaven. She says, really, Dad? I says, of course. Where else would they get the strings for the harps? She almost hit me. She almost punched me out. But anyway... Solomon closes this section by reminding us again to accept life from God's hand and enjoy it while we can. Nobody knows what the future holds, and even if we did know, we can't return uh, to life after we've died and start again. Even if you knew it was coming, you can't change it, in other words, that aspect of it. But we do know that God is sovereign control of life, and so we can submit to Him and be at peace. Faith learns to live with inconsistencies and absurdities. Why? Why? Because we live by promises and not explanations. Boy, that a precious truth. We live by promises, not by explanations. We can't explain life, but we must experience life either enduring it or enjoying it. And Solomon calls us to accept life, enjoy it a day at a time, and be satisfied. Never be satisfied with yourselves or ourselves. We've got to be satisfied with what God gives us to, in this life. And that's the real thrust of Solomon's uh, message here. We may grow in character and godliness if we live by faith. And we'll be able to say with Paul, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. That's the NIV version of Philippians 4.11. Paul says in the King James Version, I 
uh, learn to whatever state I find himself there and to be content. And uh, Well, let's, uh, let's go on to chapter 4. When Solomon first uh, examined life under the sun, his viewpoint was detached and philosophical. His conclusion that, that was, was, it was meaningless and, and monotonous. But now as he examines the question again, he's going to go where people really live, and he's going to discover that life is not that simple. Far from being monotonous, it's enigmatic. Those are contradictions. You can't have something that's enigmatic and call it monotonous. So uh, we have no idea what problems are going to occur each day. We understand why Solomon wrote Proverbs 27.1, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Same guy wrote that. So he starts in the courtroom. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore I praise the dead, which were already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. <laughs> Funny, that, last, that verse 2 reminds me of Herman Kahn. He was one of the great thinkers of previous decades. He used to give lectures at the Rand Corporation. He was the expert in thermonuclear war. But I remember one of the chapter titles of his famous volume on thermonuclear war, the definitive text that led to all the rest. Um, he said, will the living envy the dead? Interesting insight of that thinker. But anyway... Um, so I return and consider all the oppressions that were done under the sun. You know, it's interesting, uh, Ambrose Pierce defines politics. It's a strife of interests masquerading as a contest of principles. The conduct of public affairs for private advantage. That's his definition of politics in his famous Devil's Dictionary publication. The nation of Israel had an adequate judicial system based on divine law, but it could be corrupted just like anything else. Moses warned officials to just honestly and fairly in Leviticus 19, Deuteronomy 1, and so on. And both the prophet and the psalmist lashed out against social injustice. All through the scripture, a lot of verses, they'll be in your notes. And Solomon had been a wise and just king, but it was impossible for him to guarantee the integrity of every officer in government. So he went in the courtroom to watch a trial and saw the innocent people being oppressed by powerful uh, officials. The victims wept, their tears did no good. Nobody stood with them to comfort them. The oppressors had all the power. We've all seen that. In fact, it's a very common theme in movies. The movie The Verdict was an example of that. Paul Newman challenging a corrupt court in Boston. The Insider recent movie is also deals with it in another dimension. Our own experience in the courtroom has been similar. It's a, it's a roulette wheel at best. The uh, American orator Daniel Webster once called justice, quote, the ligament which holds civilized beings and nations together, close quote. Well, the body politic in Solomon's day, and I think apparently in ours, seems to have a torn ligament. But let's move on. Wherefore I praise the dead which were already dead more than the living which are yet alive. Yea, better is he that than both they which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Again, I consider it all travail, every right work, that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Now, what he's going to look here is he's going to, he's going to witness three tragedies here. Um, the oppression, exploitation in the halls of justice, the pain and sorrow in the lives of innocent people, and the unconcern on the part of those who could have brought comfort. And he was so devastated by what he saw that he thought it was better to be dead than alive. That's just his emotional reaction to the extremes he witnessed. And uh, in fact, he's saying he's better off if never being born at all than to see the evil works of man. That's, his, that's the emotional cry we're hearing here. We say, gee, he was king. Why didn't he do something about it? Because Solomon's the king, right? And uh, even the king couldn't uh, do a lot to solve this problem. See, once he started to interfere with government and started to interfere with uh, uh, the way things were organized, he could only create new problems and reveal more corruption. So there, this isn't to suggest that we should despair of cleaning out political corruption. We should all pray for all those in authority. And we should do what we can to see that just laws are passed and fairly enforced. But it's doubtful that a large administrative body like the one in Israel would ever be free of corruption, that a crusader could uh, you know, really do much to improve the uh, situation. Edward Gibbon, who uh, the author of Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, said that the political corruption was the most infallible symptom of constitutional liberty. Interesting observation. He might be right. Because where there's freedom to obey, there's also freedom to disobey. And some of Solomon's officials felt they were above the law and innocent suffered. Now, when you have a system of government like ours... 
You understand, we have an allegiance to law, to the rule of law rather than to an individual. That's what makes us distinctive. We have a commitment to a rule of law, not to any individual. But unless there's a return to accountability to that law, the legacy of the previous administration, arguably the most criminal in our recent history, uh, the seat will have cast the seeds of our own destruction. The corruption we see today are really echoes of the examples that were led uh, uh, to us by the previous from the top down. So we shouldn't be surprised. Now, disgusted with what he saw in the halls of justice, he then went to the marketplace to watch laborers at work, thinking this should be better. Honest toil was a gift. It was also ordained by God. He considered four different kinds of men. The industrious man is first in verse 4. Consider all travail, every right work, for this is a man envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. And then uh, he gets to verse 5. He looks at the idle man. The fool folds his hands together and eateth his own flesh. In other words, uh, he goes from one extreme to the other. The industrious guy who's on a treadmill and trapped, the one that's not doing anything and gets eaten up by his lifestyle, in effect. He obviously has no sympathy for lazy people because he speaks about them in the Proverbs 18, 19, 24. All, all through the Proverbs, Solomon emphasizes diligence. He realizes that laziness is a, a slow and, and uh, path towards self-destruction. Proverbs 6, for example, as you sleep, poverty creeps upon you like a robber and destroys you. Want attacks you in full armor. Paul said the same thing in first in 2 Thessalonians 3, if any would not work, they should not eat. So the industrious man was motivated by competition and was caught in the rat race. Had no leisure time. So if the idle man is motivated by pleasure and was headed for ruin. Had no productive time. And because that goes comes to the next one, and that's the integrated man, the balanced man. That's in verse 6. Better is a handful with quietness than both hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. And he really, the, the whole idea is to, is to go for balance, and we could talk a lot about that, but time's slipping away from us, so let's uh, keep moving. Then I return and saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone, there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor, neither is, he, is the eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, for whom do I labor, labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. And he's here talking about the independent man. Uh, this is a solitary man, very hard at work, but he discovered he had no relatives or partners, he had no heirs to leave his wealth to. Everything he did was for himself, but he was lonely. And he, if he died, he had no family to inherit his wealth and so forth. And uh, I think it was Socrates, the Greek philosopher, said, the unexamined life is not worth living. But see, the independent man has never stopped to ask himself, for whom am I working so hard? Why am I robbing myself in the enjoyments of life just to amass more money, in effect, and so on? So we've looked at a whole series. And so each one of these, in effect, uh, is meaningless or miserable in, in Solomon's assessment of all of this. So now he's going to move uh, to the highway. See, his experience with the independent man caused him to consider the importance of friendship and the value of people doing things together. That's the way he's moving here. He says, two is better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. If they, and if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, they have heat. How can one be warm alone? I'd like to talk to you, just to change of pace, about the golden plover. We're, we're really not changing the subject, but we're going to change the pace. The golden plover is a little tiny bird, weighs about 130 grams. And what it does every year, it flies from Alaska to Hawaii. And this chart shows you the flight time. On the left is the weight of the bird, and on the right is the fuel consumption. Now the fuel consumption, it, it weighs 130 grams normally. But in, in anticipation of its flight from Alaska to Hawaii, uh, it gains weight. It actually picks up 70 grams. And as it flies, it consumes energy. And we have the equation for the energy it consumes. It turns out that if he, fly, if he gains 70 grams, which is what he can gain, he can't get less than 130, that's his, his, his raw weight. Um, if you do the calculations at the fuel consumption, you discover this problem is he has an 88-hour flight to Hawaii, and he only has enough fuel to fly for 72 hours. There are no islands between Alaska and Hawaii. There are many mysteries as how does he navigate so, so precisely, and those are still mysteries. There are all kinds of conjectures, but they're still really mysteries. But the real problem is that if you do an analysis, he can't make it. 
He can only, by raising, the, adding 70 grams to his weight, he can only fly for 72 hours, and he's got an 88-hour flight in front of him. A quarter of a million wing flaps. They've, they've analyzed all this. But he makes it to Hawaii. The question is, how does he make it to Hawaii? He mathematically can't. You know how he does it? He flies in formation. Do you ever realize that that's why birds fly in V's? Is that they do the same thing a race driver does around a track. A race driver calls it drafting. Because if you're in the wake of the guy in front of you, you're going to use less energy, and you can use that to slingshot yourself around him if you know how to do it. Well, the birds do that in flight too. It turns out by flying in formation, he can extend his 72 hours to 88 hours and make Hawaii. In fact, he has 6.8 grams in reserve for headwinds. Now, I was going through all this. I came across it from some writings of Werner Gitt and the analysis. I was very intrigued with this one morning because I do most of my work very early. I get up early in the morning, do it early. So I'm usually through with most of my key work by the time breakfast comes. So Nan gets up about 7. We usually have breakfast at 7.30, 8. So I come down all excited about these numbers. See, isn't this interesting about this little tiny bird? And look, I go through, I go through all of this. She looked at me, and her immediate response was, gee, that just proves you can't make it by yourself. I thought, wow, isn't that just like my wife? You see, I have all the interesting little details and missed the whole point, you see. But she look, look, cuts right through that. She says, what this is saying is that you can't go it alone. The plover, the golden plover, could not get from where it has to go for winter by itself. So it goes in a group, and they rotate the lead. And he picks up a 22% improvement in fuel consumption, which turns in this case to be essential. And I, thought, I just thought that's kind of interesting. Just share that with you. You never know what's going to come up in a Chuck Missler Bible study. Two, better than one, if you're just, just going through life, it's also in terms of protection. If one prevail against them, two shall withstand them. That's of the, assuming they're under attack. And here's this famous line, often quoted from Ecclesiastes, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And again, the, the idea of threefold cord has more strength, but there's even a deeper thought here. This is often quoted with respect to marriage. Your marriage will last if it's a threefold cord. You, your spouse, and the Lord. It's a trilogy. It's going to succeed. And how precious that truth is. Anyway, it continues, better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. Solomon seems to introduce here a story. He's, he's shifting, uh, verse 13, to the palace. And uh, he's sort of uh, introducing a story that has two truths, the instability of political power and the fickleness of popularity. Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh to reign. Now there's a child apparently gets out of prison. For some reason he ends up, uh, whereas he that is born in his kingdom... Uh, becometh poor. And uh, there is a hero in the story because uh, I consider all the living which walk under the sun and the second child that shall stand up in his stead. There is no end of all people, even of all that have been before them. They also that come after all will not rejoice in him. Surely this is vanity and a vexation of spirit. In other words, the young man was born poor, but he became rich. The old king was rich, but he didn't, it didn't make him any wiser. He might as well just have been poor is, is the thought. The young man was in prison, but he got out and took the throne. The old king was imprisoned in his stupidity and within the circle of his sycophants uh, uh, and lost his throne. So the moral seems to be that wealth and position are no guarantee of success, and poverty and seeming failure are no barriers to achievement. And the key to all of this, of course, is wisdom. So apparently the young man got out of prison and took the throne because of popular demand. And uh, the way it reads, verse 15 in the New American Standard, I have seen all the living under the sun throng to the side of the second lad who replaces him. Replaced the old king. And it looked like the young kid had it made, but alas, his popularity didn't last. The, uh, new, the uh, Living Bible says that he can become the leader of millions of people and be very popular, but then the younger generation grows up around him and rejects him. The new crowd deposed the king and appointed somebody else, is the thought. So it goes on, verse 16, There is no end to all people, even that, even all that they have seen before them, they also that come after shall not rejoice in them. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. So again, once again, Solomon drew the same conclusion, vanity and vexation of spirit, or grasping at wind. So no matter where he went, no matter what aspect of life he studied, he learned an important lesson from the Lord. When he looked up, he saw that God was in control of life and balanced its various experiences. That was the first eight verses of chapter 3. When he looked within, he saw that man was made for eternity and that God would make all things beautiful in their time. 
When he looked ahead, he saw the last enemy of death. Then as he looked around, he understood that life is complex, difficult, and not easy to explain. One thing is sure, no matter where you look, you see trials and problems and people who could use some encouragement. So strangely enough, Psalm is not cynical about life. Nowhere does he tell us to get out of the rat race and retreat to some safe and comfortable corner in the world where nothing can bother us. Life does not stand still. It comes at us with full speed, without warning, and we stand up and take it, and with God's help, make the most of it. So if this chapter teaches us anything, is that we need one another, because two are better than one. There are some advantages to the independent life, but there are also disadvantages, and we discover them painfully as we get older. In verse 6, the New, the New King James says, Better is a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. So it's good to have things that money can buy, provided that you don't lose the things that money can't buy. What is it really costing you in terms of life to get the things that are important to you? I often talk to people about budgeting and so forth. The key thing when you try to budget yourself, not dollars, take your time. What's demanding your time? You can always get more money. You can all get, also get, always get more things. You can't get more time. Time is your most precious commodity, and when you budget, budget your time. And make sure that there's time for everything. That brings us back to the opening 14 comparables that open the study. Time is the precious commodity. Time is the thing to budget because it's, it's the only thing of which the supply is inelastic. You have a fixed number of days, whatever they are. And, uh, What's really important to you? How much of the permanent are you sacrificing to get your hands on the temporary? Remember what Jesus said, just to wrap this up. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.